Learn the most advanced recruiting techniques. Land the most desirable talent. Launch your company towards massive success. This is the Higher Power Radio Show with Rick Gerard. Today we're talking about the battle between your need to fill a role versus hiring for cultural alignment. You know, actually, today's quote summarizes it just perfectly. Acquiring the right talent is the most important key to growth. Hiring was and still is the most important thing we do. You have any idea who said that, Ben? No. Rick, tell me. That was Mark Benioff, ah. the CEO and founder of Salesforce. Now, if he says it, then every we should all believe it, right? Yeah. Well, he also marched in the streets of San Francisco against software. So if he was doing that... Against about, software? Yeah, you're like marching through the street. When was that? All about the cloud. When Salesforce was coming up in the early 2000s. I did Led not a know protest that. in the streets of San Francisco. No more software. Wow. See, you learn something new every day. There you go. I'm Rick Gerard, and welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show. Our mission is to help entrepreneurs and hiring managers avoid costly hiring mistakes. We identify a specific problem and provide proven tactical solutions to help your company win the hire. We share insights from top performing rebel entrepreneurs, disruptors, and industry experts like our guest today, Mr. Ben Mones. Ben is the co-founder and CEO of Fama Technologies, which is an AI-based solution that identifies problematic behavior among potential hires and current employees. By analyzing publicly available uh, online information, he founded Fama in 2015 to address the needs of organizations everywhere that are grappling with the challenges of protecting their workplace culture and preventing harassment. So Ben's been through the muck a bit as a founder, and uh, which makes him a perfect expert for today's topic. Ben, welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show. Thanks a lot, Rick. Great to be here. Appreciate Absolutely. It. Excited to have you. We've been talking on and off for yep. a while. So, uh-huh. All right. So today we're going to cover a few things. We're going to talk about why and how culture shapes your business. We're going to talk about ego over common sense. Mm-hmm. We're gonna, you're going to show your story of hiring a rock star, right? That's right. All right. Easiest and then thing ever. <laughs> lessons learned from uh, in, in the structure to follow for all you entrepreneurs out there. So let's delve right into it. Why is it important to invest in culture? Is that for me? That's for you. All right, got it. Let's so, go. uh, yeah, so from my perspective, you know, we, and part of it is the fact the company that I run, we focus on culture day in and day out. Uh, as you mentioned, identifying problematic behavior across new hires, existing employees. So, uh, that's core to how I manage companies. So I think about entrepreneurship in general. So, Human behavior, in my perspective, and the thing that actually drives successful outcomes for companies, whether it's productivity, whether it's innovation, does start at the human level. So when you think about things like a toxic workplace, when you think about a workplace that's rife with harassment, it's one of these things that we all know. It's one of these things that we all know when a disengaged employer or a disengaged hire has the potential to adversely affect the business. But it's only been recently that we're able to actually quantify the impact that toxicity has on productivity and innovation inside of a company. So it's not a kumbaya thing. It's not something that is just for the sake of doing it. But from my perspective, it's one of these things that actually does drive outcomes for a business. And there's actually some really interesting research guy named Michael Hoosman at a Cornerstone On Demand who wrote a whole white paper on it and a whole bunch of other research beyond that. So. I, I've lived it. You have. I've, I've been there. I've had a rock star person that worked for me at one point. That person was pulling in probably three quarters of the production on a monthly basis for wow. the rest of the team, but nobody could stand that person. And then that person left hmm. and our production went up 300% the following month. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. It's one of these things, I think, that when you bring someone into your organization, a leader, someone of influence, uh, the power that's granted to them has the dual effect of one – immediately shaping culture in a positive light or potentially infringing upon it down the road. And we think, oh, it's just my executive. Oh, I just have to make sure I find the right exec. Anyone else just going to come through the door. But in a startup in the early days, everyone has power. Everyone has that potential to drive that impact. Startup, everybody is so important. Right. Everybody that you bring out of the company helps shape the culture. Absolutely. Yeah, so very true. You and I talked on the phone about hiring rock stars and and how it's my my take on it is it's really more of an ego based decision a lot of times sure. because hey I I was able to attract somebody out of Google you totally know? they don't often I I don't see like a lot of success stories usually if somebody comes out of a company like that they founded the company and they've grown into mm. like they they're building their own thing that's that's a different scenario than somebody going out and actively plucking somebody from that company right uh, I I haven't heard too many great experiences with that. It's not to say it doesn't work. 
Um, but I think to your point, the way that ego drives some of these decisions as an entrepreneur, and I'm sure folks that are watching, listening can empathize with this, but we're always looking for ways to demonstrate signal to the outside. We're always looking to go to our investors, to go to the marketplace, to go to our potential customers, to even go to our friends and family as we're like busting our butts. Work. Can I say butts? You can say whatever you want. Busting our butts, working on yeah. this huge thing that we got going. And we're looking for <laughs> You can ways. say ass if you want even. Well, you said it. Oh, I did. Right. Uh, uh, but anyway, <laughs> we're all working. It is a podcast. It is a podcast. We're all working super hard uh, on building this thing. It's our own domain. It's our own universe. It's our own environment. We're seeking these extra company ways to validate ourselves. So often we find ourselves just looking for that one little anchor that can help us go to investor and say, hey, look. Look at what I just got from Google. Look at this engineer I just got from Amazon. I just got this sales lead from LinkedIn, and she is an absolute rock star. We're going to crush it. You know, it's, it's but that does that sort make of a mentality. difference though when you're raising capital? I think in the early stages, it does in a very small way at the beginning of the conversation. When an investor is doing the pattern recognition, they hear hundreds, if not thousands, of pitches on an annual basis. They do look for those little types of signal, but. Ultimately, that ego versus what's right for the company. Is this person going to represent my mission and values as an organization? And that's not my mission and values personally as a leader of the company, but the collective business. So I think part of it is taking a clear and informed understanding of what your business stands for from a cultural standpoint, from a value standpoint, and to define that collectively and then ensure that whoever comes into your organization fits that mold. Because like we were saying a moment ago, that person is going to have the power to either detract or extend from your mission as an organization, and it's imperceptible. They don't even know they're doing it. You don't know they're doing it. It's not until after the fact that you realize, as you did, oh, something went wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Person leaving and me thinking, oh, gosh. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Right. And then all of a sudden, like everybody else was having a party. <laughs> having <laughs> a party. super excited about it. It's funny. Wow, it was so great. That person left. And and. The motivation just went through the roof. It was crazy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And even if you're falling behind on a project or you have a short deadline or you're looking at your revenue forecast for the year, you're like, oh, my gosh, how am I going to get there without, you know, that rock star will just pick another company from, I don't know, Instagram or someone to come on and, and help me sell and build brand packages and get my software out the door. But in fact, you know, you shouldn't be looking, in my point of view, at that this person's going to come in and drive this input and this potential output. You know, it's not that simple. It's not – there's so many dynamics when it comes to people, which I think is one great part about a show like this is we get to get into that nitty-gritty detail yeah. and talk about it because there's so much more than input and output. Well, you should be looking for performers, not rock stars. Sure. If you think about what a rock star is, I think of Motley <laughs> Crue. <laughs> did you see that yeah. Netflix Motley Crue? I did see that. I did see that. I mean, well, one of my good buddies was actually in that. Oh, really? Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. So they go into a hotel room. They don't leave it the same way when they leave, right? Sure. I mean, they destroyed every room they went into. And and the thing that's actually unique about toxic employees that most people don't really tap into is that they're actually overperformers themselves. They can perform and outperform the standard because of their ability, but it is the effect on their sphere of influence that I've seen over time. It's not necessarily their output individually, but... It's the output of the team members around them, of the people that they interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Those are the folks where you see actually a dip in productivity as opposed to, you know, on the other side of it, the uh, uh, folks themselves who might actually perform. So it's the, the cause and effect rather right. than the, the actual work that they're doing themselves. That's my point of view. Yeah. Okay. You're listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. I'm Rick Gerard. And for our podcast listeners, we're going to take a quick educational moment for our sponsors. Find out how healing a person's pain points attracts amazing people to your company. Sign up for our free webinar at stridesearch.com. Our guest today is Ben Moniz. He's the co-founder and CEO of Fama Technologies. And we're talking about, well, we're talking about culture, which is our, our engineer Paul's favorite subject again today. <laughs> Woohoo! We're going to drive this all month. Yeah, yeah. I'm let's ride let's this, go for four hours. I'm going to ride this pony. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see Paul in from the door later on. Oh. Uh, that wouldn't be fun. Yeah, that wouldn't be cool. All right. So let's talk about story. You've gone through this, right? Sure. You've actually gone through 
an actual where you hired rock stars. So share some of that with us. Like what, what's, what, what has been your experience? Sure. Um, you know, in hiring again, there's a lot of variables that are influencing the decisions that you make that are largely driven by performance and by output. And it's easy to grasp at the shiny resume, the engineer that comes in and knocks out the code test that, you know, might've been a little rough around the edges in the interview process, but damn, like he crushed that engineering test, right? And his reference was outstanding. You know, and he worked at a company too that grew from zero to 100 and he was there the entire time. I feel like in the interview process, we give that person a hall pass. Like oh, we yeah. really don't look at whether or not that person is going to fit the culture. Instinctively, we do. Yes. But I think that's the challenge that, that we're talking but about people, right now. People like ignore those warning signs. And it's funny, yeah, in this particular case where I went through exactly what I'm describing and we hired a, a person who looked great on paper and resume checked out and references, you know, across the board. And I even remember in the interview process before bringing this guy on board that we all said, you know what, there's something a little bit different about the way this person works. Some of the questions that he answered, some of the way that he responded to a few of the open-ended statements that we try to offer in the interview process to just gauge how well someone might be aligned with our culture – was off. But the instinct is... Where was it off? It was off in the sense that we knew that he was answering questions not in the way that we would answer the question. And that our core team members, we try and treat every employee that comes in, every candidate that comes in, excuse me, as if they were a long-term employee at the company. You know, the candidate experience well, for that's me... That's a good way to look at it. Actually, you said totally. something really critical there. Like every employee that comes in... Cause is an employee. You treat everybody like they're going to be a potential employee. You're going to get a much richer experience out of it. Right. And while I might have had in the interview process an employee answered a question the way that this person did, I might have said something about it. I might have intervened in one way or another, but clouded by this company that he came from, clouded by the experience that we had in the, the interview process, we uh, decided to just ignore our instinct and ignore our gut. And sure enough, when you know, this person came on board, it became very clear that they weren't aligned with our working style, that the way that they executed day in and day out, that they managed, that they led was completely misaligned. Was this somebody who was leading an organization or part of the team? Yeah, who was oh, part okay. of the organization. Yeah. So joining, uh, you know, joining the business and coming in and having his own way of, of doing things, of having his own perspective on the way that the company should grow and should execute and it being misaligned with the rest of the team and leadership was a problem. And it's not as if it's our way or the highway, but to have the constructive discussion around, here's why I see the way that work should be done. Here's why I see that this is the right strategy to pursue here. Here are the five examples of wins and losses in my background that are pointing me to this is the right path forward. None of that discussion happened. It was very different. They lacked, I think, a core value of ours, which is empathy, lacked some of the other values related to, you know, collaboration and willingness to be wrong. And those are things that we picked up in the interview process, but candidly didn't do anything about just because we wanted we wanted that rock star. Did that help you secure funding? No, not you already, at all. You had already had funding at yep, this point. Not at all. Okay. Yeah. Which lends an interesting angle to the earlier statement, which yeah. is that, you know, it, it's almost that... You're telling yourself in some ways that look at who we could attract, look at who we could bring on board. Um, so it might, it might, it might even be the purest egotistical management team failure. And I'm sure other people have dealt with this too, but you know, you, uh, it, it, it makes you really focus on the actual. Value You're not alone. You're I've in. seen it lots of times. Good. Well, yeah. I know. talk to a lot of companies and I've seen it lots of times where, the, you know, I sit down sometimes with the CEO and I'll go, Oh God, let me tell you this one story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so most of them are willing to come on the show and share it, though. So kudos to you for doing so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of our audience is entrepreneurs and people who are kind of trying to come through the ranks and sure. build their organizations. What roadmap should they follow in order for them to stay true to their, themselves, their company, um, not chase shiny objects or mm. purple squirrels or rainbow unicorns or yeah. whatever you want to call them? Nice. A bar of, of uh, disillusionment where what you really need and what you really can attract mm. are just two totally different things. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Um, and 
think the first step is, and this is very complex and we'll probably overly simplify it here, but just knowing exactly what you need and who you are as an organization. What you need might be a strategic discussion across the management team to outline the core skill sets, the potential outcomes, the potential deliverables, the KPIs that you want to measure, and then kind of back into what an ideal profile looks like, maybe work experience, time in the field, et cetera. But beyond the actual ability of an individual from a quantitative standpoint, I think the number one thing a company should do is know yourself and try and identify what it is about your company. What are those cultural guidelines? What are those signposts, if you will, that we have to move between to really build a successful and thriving culture that isn't what we read on Fast Company, isn't what we read in some Medium blog post, but is who we are as an organization, right? It's not Travis at Uber. It's not Mark at Facebook. It's not any other CEO that you want to pick out. It's you as an organization, right? Yeah. And it's how do we take insight from across our entire organization? And that's customers, that's team, that's investors, that's the general ecosystem in which you operate. What's important to your company? So I always like to call this the you want to buy a Rolls Royce on a K-Bart budget or a Hyundai budget, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that happens quite often. So being realistic with the type of people, but actually going a step further and defining out who that person is. Right. Thinking about what traits does this person need to have? Where are our gaps as a team? And right. how do we augment those with maybe somebody else? Yeah. Self-awareness. I mean, it's one of the things that is so important, you know, personally for me in my life, but also professionally. It's one of these things that if you can truly question yourself as a founder and God, as a CEO. I do it every day. <laughs> <laughs> question yourself is maybe not the right term, but, but dig into no. the, you know, the automatic systems that are running in the back of your mind all the time and really take a moment to try and consider what are those core skill sets? How do I react in those scenarios? Am I confrontational? Do I need someone that's got a little bit of a softer touch? Uh, those are the sorts of things that you got to try and answer. And again, if you bring someone in, especially the first 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 employees at a company, everyone's got a ton of power. Everyone's got the power to influence. So being able to ensure that each person who comes in is moving in the same direction that we are as a company uh, and is going to help us challenge ourselves and drive more self-awareness uh, is something that's really important. Okay. So you have to know who you are. Know who you are. And what you need. What you need. That's right. All right. What's next? Structured interview process. That was one thing that we uh... didn't. <laughs> I wish you had a sound effect for that. I know, right? That'd be cool. Um, yeah, the... that was my that was my attempt at the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. I, I got it. I, I'm sure your listeners knew exactly what that was, and Absolutely viewers too. Not. Everyone knew who that exactly was... what that weird sound was. Um, <laughs> no, but the uh, either that or a dying goat. Oh, okay. No? I could do that as a bonus outtakes. Uh, <laughs> the the. Other thing I think, you know, is, is that structured interview process is something that we didn't have early on, but really structuring and ensuring that a diversity of perspective is involved in that interview <clears throat> process. But also from a candidate experience standpoint, I know we touched on it a moment ago, but treating people like you would want to be treated when you walk into an interview, which is such a basic first grade kindergarten mentality that you get drilled into you that we seem to forget as we get older and become professional. But to, to come in to an organization for an interview and to be greeted with a smile, to be greeted with that warm body language, to be offered a glass of water and also – How's your day going? You know, that type of thing. Not just like you're going to sit in this seat and have one glass of water. See, I believe and that's ego driven too. Well, how do you mean? Think about it. I mean, you kind of start – sometimes founders get in their head and they start thinking, okay, we're this great special company and this person should be honored to come interview with us. Oh, yeah. It's a little, that's... It's a little egotistical. Yeah. That's a personality thing too, I think. I think you run into – I yeah. know some fantastic entrepreneurs, some fantastic – non-entrepreneurs who behave that way and who don't behave that way. So it just depends on the person. Why do startups not think about this structured interview process sooner? It usually is a result of, oh, crap, we lost a bunch of people. And now we got to think about what we're doing. <laughs> right. right? We That's... tried to hire eight people and yeah. they all turned us down. Right. Maybe we should start thinking about structuring something. All right. All right. Yeah. That, I think that honestly probably is the driver of, of most people that are doing it uh, and, and actually putting a process in place. But, you know, it's one of these things that – Is that our, what happened with you guys? No. Did you lose people? No. No. It, it wasn't that we lost people in the process. I think, you know, for us, we went through a phase of realizing like 
we're no longer just a group of five or six people sitting in a garage. And we literally had a garage that we worked out of. It was like a modified one wall was a garage door. That is so HP and Apple of you. It was cool. <laughs> it was in, uh, uh, yeah, it was over in, in West LA. But we realized we're like no longer just five or six people in a garage. And we actually had to bring in process to ensure that the diversity of opinion that we had in the organization and background and expertise was accurately reflected in the process. And as an HR tech company, you know, we got to eat our own dog food and, and live and everything that we sell. Perfect. So structured process, anything else? You know, this is something that you and I, and, and I actually reflected on the, the conversation afterwards. But one of the things I, I said to Rick when we were prepping was uh, related to talking to more people throughout the interview process. Um, and you shared that you're you're not into that. You don't no, like that. I don't. Well, I think you should treat each person as if they're your only person. Because then you're looking at them through a lens of, gosh, if this is our only person, sure, then you're going to... Let's say it's your last person. Usually yeah. the first person in the interview process gets kind of screwed over because of the fact they're like, well, let's see what else we can get. Right. We have other people in the process. And that sometimes is your best candidate. Right. And then you go back later and you're trying to get that person. That person's checked out. Right. And in this market, you can't do it. Yeah. Tight. I mean, look, the, this conversation also when you're in a tight labor market with engineering or sales or marketing or pretty much anything in tech, you're always in a tight labor market, at least in this economy where it is today. But that being said, for me, you know, I know confirmation bias is a thing. Yeah. I know you found someone that you like. You want to move forward with them. What else is out there? Who else could I go find? Maybe I'm not going to move forward with this person. Um, but, you know, for me, I don't necessarily – I think if you acknowledge a confirmation bias and you just say that out loud to your co-founder, to the hiring team, for me, it's generating a counterpoint or a confirmation to my own point of view. To be able to go in and actually establish that, yeah, I understand the market now and beyond the – what a recruiter tells you the market looks like or someone in talent. And there's some great folks in LA that I've worked with. I also want to see for myself. I also want to see who's out there and I want to be able to confirm and, you know, hire someone after looking at a few different examples which of the, different there, types of approaches. Which there's nothing wrong with that. Sure. It's just, you do need to prep the person and make sure that they understand that. Sure. And that's where, that's where companies get into trouble because they'll say, they'll kind of either go somebody and well, let's just sit on for a couple of days or a week even. Yeah. And without giving them feedback. Yeah. That's, so, that's look, at, we've got two other people that are that are in the process. Let's talk to them. And we'll get back to you. It's just a communication thing. Sure. What are your three takeaways? What, what do you want people to walk out of here with? Sure. So I'd say one, that human behavior drives outcomes inside of an organization. I think it's one thing that I've experienced personally. And I would encourage anybody who's out there who's watching right now or listening right now to remember that, that the people in your organization are the most important part of the organization itself. Mark Benioff said it too. Mark Benioff. And he don't lie. Yeah. And he's doing pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's the first key takeaway, I would say. All right. Uh, second takeaway would be really understanding your company and who you are as an organization and taking that time and investing that effort. That would be the second one, I would say. And you help me with a third one. What do you think would be a good third takeaway from today's discussion? I like the collaborative aspect. Oh, look at you. Yeah. God, you just totally threw me. I, you know, I like the idea of, of treating each candidate as an individual. And if their first candidate's the right candidate, make a decision swiftly and, and move forward with them. Yeah. Yeah. I was, it's funny. I was going to pick that one too. Were you? Yeah. Woo. Oh, All right. Man. Well, we're just about out of time for today's show. Ben, thanks so much for your time investment today. And I want to welcome you to the Higher Power Radio community. Um, now, what would be the best way for members of audience to find you, find your company? I'm sure we've got somebody who wants to use your platform. Give us sure. a quick plug. Go. Sure. Uh, well, first off, thank you, Rick, for having me. It's been great. Love talking with you. Love uh, hanging out here. And, absolutely. And uh, definitely want to come back if you'll have me. So oh, let me know. dude, we'll make you a recurring guest. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah. And secondly, <laughs> uh, you can check us out online, fama.io, F-A-M-A dot I-O. Um, and if you're in hiring, recruiting, and looking at ways that you can improve talent screening and the ways that you bring folks into your organization, ensuring that they do reflect your mission values as a company, Check out our website. Fill Make sure you get form. rid of all the creepers before you bring them in, right? That's right. No more uh, homophobes, no <laughs> sexists, nothing like that. That's what we stand for. So uh, hope we can help spread that. That's – yeah, it's powerful. Thank all right, you. perfect. Oh, I want to thank our listening audience for tuning into this week's episode of Higher Power. A quick thanks to our team, our engineer, Paul Roberts. Our producers, Andrea Ballin, Shanti Ryle, and creative director, Ayla Gerard. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe, review, and share, and comment. Keep commenting. We love your feedback. Um, I take it full hearted 
some of the harsh stuff I got, and I love it. So <laughs> th- keep throwing get it in at that us. comment section. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, get in that comment section and beat me up. I love it. <laughs> you can join the Higher Power Radio community at Higher. That's H I R E Power P O W E R Radio R A D I O dot com, or drop me an email at Rick at stridesearch dot com to learn about our passive talent webinars and workshops. I have a webinar today and workshop tomorrow. So we're right. busy. Tune in next week. Our guest is going to be MJ Shores. MG is a chief marketing officer. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and you have been listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. Aloha. Thank you for listening to Higher Power with Rick Gerard on OC Talk Radio.